This episode of Going In Raw is sponsored by BetterHelp. Several years ago, I was dealing with the case of the blues during the holidays, and therapy was a bright spot amid all the stress and anxiety. Something to look forward to, to help me feel grounded, and to provide me with the tools I needed to manage everything that was going on. And if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's completely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited for your schedule. All you got to do to get started is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched up with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash raw today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash raw. Hey, friendo, Steve here. Bell Arson. Welcome back to Going In Raw Countout. On this episode, we're talking, ooh, stinky free agents in the world of professional wrestling. Uh, you know, this is going to be an interesting episode because I don't think this can all like, for some of these anyways, as I was looking through them, yeah. can't, can't really put blame on on the ill fit between company and wrestling. No, not at all. Not at all. You know, it, it, the names mentioned here, it's not like, oh, there was a bad signing because the person that we're naming here per entry, you know, necessarily, in every instance at least, did something wrong. Right. They're terrible. They're right. garbage. They, right. It's not that. It's just, a lot of it is circumstance. Right. Yeah. You know, it's a, so a worst it's, free agent signing is, does it work for your team, for your exactly. promotion. You know, we could, yes. if this was a sports podcast, I'm sure we'd have a ball talking about free agent signings for various sports teams, you know? Yeah, there's There's been countless free agent signings in the, in, in the world of sports, regardless of sport, where you have an immensely talented player mm -hmm. that goes to a team and you think, ah, mm. this is going to be great. And you mm -hmm. come to find out it's a bad fit between right. system and player. It's the right. same thing in wrestling. This, this, this is a situation where... I'm sure we're going to get some heat maybe for this first entry here. There's a lot of circumstance that led to this leading, which is debatable, to it being a bad signing. Okay, well, let's go ahead and dive into it. And I'm going to let you, I'm going to let you handle this first one. Number 10. 10. I have to say it too. Yeah, CM Punk and AEW. Oh, what? Go ahead, Larson. Lay out your case for so, why CM Punk is a bad signing for AEW. So let's, let's go back to the summer of, two, of 2021. Wonderful time. I know. Uh, uh, where it seemed like uh, th 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 that there is a, 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 a seismic shift in the world of professional wrestling. True, true. And by that, I mean with that, within about a month's time, AEW brought in CM Punk, Adam Cole, and Brian Danielson. Three huge names. That huge. At least two of the three could have signed massive money deals to remain in WWE. And AEW... Managed to land all three of them. Yeah. And it felt like a huge moment in the history of wrestling where AEW, this upstart company, uh, uh, was, 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 you know, trying to make a dollar and cent in the wrestling business. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Had gone farther in terms of being competition to WWE than anybody since WCW. Now they just landed three huge names. Yeah. Right. And it's not like, oh, they're going to overtake Raw in the ratings. It wasn't like that. It was just like, okay, there's a, there's a real competition it's going It's an alternative. Right it's, it's something, a oh, we love these guys. And, you know, if, if anybody is going to use them the way that WWE should have used them, which let's be honest, that's always AEW's thing is we're going to do things the way WWE should have done them. Yes, of course, this is back when Vince was still running creative. Yeah. Um, summer of 2021. So, CM Punk comes in, a lot of excitement. First return is return to wrestling after seven years away from the business. Um, and it generated tons of excitement, not just for AEW, but for wrestling fans all over. Yeah. Absolutely. And in basically every capacity, initially, it was a massive success. Mm -hmm. He was involved in some interesting storylines. Tony Khan dubbed the plus Delta of oh, AEW, yeah. whatever that means. Yeah, right. right. He, he was improving ticket sales, pay-per-view buys, mm -hmm. so on and so forth. He was increasing so many metrics. Mm -hmm. That is until it's the backstage stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, and and here, I, this is a situation where, again, this, I'm not saying CM Punk is bad backstage. That's not what I'm trying to say here, because who knows? There could have been backstage issues before Punk showed up, and we just didn't hear about it. Mm -hmm, you know? Sure. Yeah. It's entirely possible. 
but it, you know, it started with the, the rumors about Colt Caban. Mm-hmm. And then it seemed like lines were drawn in the locker room. Mm-hmm. And again, that's not necessarily CM Punk's fault. I'm not blaming him for that. Right. Personalities can clash. We know that. Exactly. Yeah. I'm not saying that he was the, 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 the genesis of any of that. It happened. though. I think you're taking the, the scenic route towards saying AEW pre-CM Punk versus AEW now, was it worth the hassle? Is that what you're exactly. getting at here? That's what, I'm, that's what I'm getting at in that, you know, we all know what happened after, you know, it was brawl out. He was gone. He, at that press media scrum, he put the the entire company on blast while yeah. Cody Khan sitting there. It was a yeah. massive public relations black eye for the company. Mm-hmm. It made the company look bad. Yeah. He blasted the EVPs. He blasted Hangman Page. Right. And it, it, he had his reasons for doing it. And it's, it's up to it, each and every individual whether you agree with those reasons or not. But it, the issue I always found with it is not that he had problems with people. Is that how he addressed it publicly in such a manner that it just made the company look bad. All right. We've litigated this before. He goes away. He comes back. And yes. he comes back. Not just he just doesn't come back. He comes back with a show basically run by him, provided for him to keep him away from the people he had a beef with. And that show is on the verge of being canceled, Larson. Well, how about the verge of being canceled? But seemingly, and who knows if CM Punk even wanted to come back to AEW. Maybe he was like, all right, I'm under contract. I, I have no choice. I have to come back. We don't know. We don't know for sure. Maybe he never wanted to come back. Maybe he wanted to go to WWE after Brawl Out because he's tired of the place. I don't know. Yeah. But he came back. He was given his own show. Didn't have to deal with the elite at all. Yeah. Seemingly, he had veto power and who was on his show and who wasn't. True. Uh, and and yet, he still got into a fight. Jack Perry. Yeah. yeah. Backstage all in. And that was it. And here yeah. we are about a little bit more than two years later. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if anybody could argue that AEW is in a better position now than they were in that summer of 2021. So you're right. The, I guess the, the the big caveat, the big sort of but here would be uh, if, if AEW lands like a huge TV rights deal, then I think we could agree that they would be in a better position now than they were. That being said... It's one of those things where is it better to have loved and lost than never to have never loved, loved at, all? at all? Yes, because for that moment, it really did. And I don't know, dude, I don't know if AEW hadn't signed Punk. I just don't know. Like, you know, at, at a certain point along the way, I mean, there's a lot to unpack. There is. And and. There is there is some some awful leadership from Tony Khan during that period that True. probably led to a lot of problems. Again, yeah, I'm, it's, it's not a situation where we're laying the blame at the feet of CM Punk here. That's not the case. It's right, a situation right. where he was brought into a situation. Initially, it seemed like a really good fit. At the end of the day, though, it's a little more up for debate concerning how things fell apart. Yeah, no, and I yeah was I was was, was the issues that arise from that bad fit worth whatever benefits they got from it. I and mean, I'm not saying can, I have an answer. I'm asking the question. You definitely, you definitely got to wonder, you know, that the, his return was such a bright point for AEW. That return does not come without the understanding of what happened in the end. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like, oh my God, this awesome moment. When AEW reaches their 10 year mark, and they do a retrospective of the best moments of the last 10 years. If all things are equal, and let's say three years from now, CM Punk drops like a shoot promo, an autobiography, and he, we get all the details from his point of view, putting him on blast. The relationship stays frayed is my point. Yeah. Would they... You don't think that they would show off because that is sort of like the biggest the biggest moment in AEW history is that it's his return. There isn't a bigger moment than that. That is when and you got it exactly right. That's when AEW became a true alternative to WWE. Before that, it was a lot of indie wrestlers and New Japan guys. But when they got punk, that was huge. 
And then, of course, Cole and Danielson, who have paid off in, in, in massive yeah. ways in the yeah. positive with no negatives there. Um, but you got, you know, if, if they're, if they can't go back and reflect on that as a positive in the, in the long run, then maybe your case is solid that it was in the end, not worth it. You can't go back and talk about that. If, 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 if the relationship stays the same, even though thousands upon thousands of millions of people, literally millions of people, because people watched it, millions of people saw this and were mesmerized by it and thought it was this amazing moment. And now it's kind of a stain. It's like, well, I'm not going to go there, but there are certain moments in WWE's history that they won't go back and celebrate. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, because of who's involved these days, here's, it's, it's very few, but here, here's what I think would pr most likely happen if they have, you know, the 10 year anniversary episode of dynamite and they have a clip show aspect of it. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, maybe they have individual segments talking about great moments in AEW history. Mm -hmm, yeah. You know, and maybe they'll have people talking about them. I would be surprised if one of those segments involves CM Punk's return. That being said, if they have like a montage either to start or begin the show, you know, with some, some you know, really kind of anthemic music going with it, they might show Punk's return there. Yeah, okay. They'll yeah. reference it. I don't know if they're going to get too deep into the conversation about it. Yeah. 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 No, it's, it's, it's an interesting point of view. One, which we'd love you guys to uh, uh, debate again. I don't have the answer. I'm asking the question here. And I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good conversation to have. Yeah, man. Absolutely. Well, uh, we'll find out if there's, if it's a good conversation in our comments, <laughs> be civil people. Let's move on to number nine, nine, the August one warning Tito Ortiz identity <laughs> revealed this is wildly fun to talk about uh, because we can be on the same page here. So back yeah. uh, in the lead up to August 1st, there was gang warfare in TNA between the main event mafia and the aces and eights uh, pseudo motorcycle crew. Did, yeah. do, do we know if they ever showed them on motorcycles? Like, was it actually a motorcycle crew? Because I don't know. If Eric Bischoff else. was booking it, the answer is probably yes. Probably, yeah, right. I don't think it was. Was he there? Uh, who knows? Who cares? I don't even know if he was there in 2013. That's there, when yeah. this happened. Uh, so, uh, yeah, because they were there early, like 2009, I think, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Whatever it was. So, uh, in the during the, the heat of this battle, there uh, were video vignettes, which uh, showed a silhouetted bald man who uh, was making his return or his, his debut in TNA on August the 1st. It was the August 1 warning. Well, actually, Tito actually made some appearances in 2005. Oh, so this was his return. Okay, his okay. return, yeah. Okay, so I think, because I think it was, it was like said that these vignettes indicated that it was a return to the, no, I forget if they specified it was a return to the company because the article I read uh, indicated that the fan, the general fan base, uh, believe that it could be somebody like Stone Cold Steve Austin or like a Goldberg, somebody who hadn't been there yet. And so uh, there are these, you know, vignettes and people are like, oh, what wrestler is going to show up? Uh, and of course, Rampage Jackson was part of the main event mafia. In November, there was scheduled a Bellator fight between mm -hmm. Tito Ortiz and, and Rampage. And I'm really curious to see if any of the message boards from back in the day, if anybody was able to figure out that it was Tito Ortiz for this awful fight marketing integration. Uh, and so eventually during a tense standoff on August 1st between the main event mafia and their new friend Rampage Jackson, who was awesome, by the way, I love Rampage. Yeah. He was great. Yeah. And the aces and eights headed up, uh, I believe, at that time by Ken Anderson. I don't remember seeing Bubba Ray out there. More, uh, more on Ken Anderson later. Yeah. Uh, so uh, all of a sudden, like, uh, you know, the lights go down or whatever, and then you hear some, like, vaguely sinister but mostly sort of sleep-inducing music. And uh, Tito Ortiz shows up to the shock and surprise of Mike Tanay and Mike Tanay only. Yeah. Because he says, you know, August one warning, identity revealed, it's Tito Ortiz. And literally, nobody, nobody, I tell you, nobody in that crowd uh, reacted in any way, shape, or form, which is interesting because I, I don't believe that it's not, I don't believe that it's because they didn't know who he was. Yeah. Because everybody knew who Tito Ortiz was. Yeah. 
Yeah. It was, why is this guy here? He's not in this sport. He needs to stop. And we want like a Goldberg or a Stone Cold or something. Yeah, I think it was a matter of, 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 of TNA raising expectations. Yeah. You know, intentionally or not, ex- expectations were raised. And rather than getting, you know, a legend of the sport of pro wrestling, Tito Ortiz shows up. And it's the quietest I have heard a crowd, probably second only to the Bobby Fish bit in yeah. Impact several years later. And he just um, stands there. And he crosses yeah. his arms like this for like and the then most they cut to reaction shots to aces and eights and, and main event mafia. <sighs> yeah, yeah, Ken. An- <laughs> it's all just Ken Anderson. Doing. And then there's two of these, and then he goes back to him and is like whispering to yeah. somebody over here. Yeah, and then like you know, it's, it's not shock. It's just kind of like mild confusion. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, like, what am I going to have for lunch after this? I know. Yeah, I was thinking about lunch. Tito was. showed up that interrupted my thought process. I need to return to what I'm thinking about lunch. So yeah, Tito I was thinking ended something up really good, but what was it? Yeah, what was it? Was it a club sandwich? No, I had that yesterday. <laughs> yesterday, but you can never Ruben, have that too nah, many times. I'm not huge on Rubens. Might be another club. Uh, maybe I'll just do another club. They're safe or BLT. <laughs> so it ended up Tito was in uh, TNA Impact for a grand total of about six weeks because okay. uh, September of 2013 at No Surrender. It was announced that Bellator said, "All right, Tito, you're out. You're you're gone from TNA because you got this fight." Yeah, I didn't know if uh, so. The sports, the way I think, the, I think it was a sports article. The way they framed it, Bellator pulled it uh, because it was just a really bad angle, and they didn't want people thinking that the Bellator fight was rigged. Was a pro wrestling match. Uh, uh, I have no what, idea. That's just. Why did their... no one think of that to begin with? Then <laughs> yeah, that's a great point. Uh, I mean, again, from the article I read, maybe they didn't realize TNA was going to go so full on ahead with this. <laughs> the, 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 the enthusiasm was too much for them to bear. I don't know. I do know that I was watching uh, some clips from uh, this ordeal, not just the reveal, but later on when Rampage was uh, in the ring p- uh, pushing, I'm sorry, uh, pitching, joining the main event mafia to Tito Ortiz. Two things to note during this back and forth. The crowd was actually into the promo. Like the when they actually were talking, the crowd was into it. Whenever Tito would say something or Rampage would say something and they had a punctuation, the crowd would react. So this wasn't indicative of the entire thing, yeah, yeah, although yeah, the yeah. entire thing was seemed pretty limp anyways. But it wasn't like a confused, silent crowd the entire time. Another thing to note about that actual promo is that at one point, Tito Ortiz says, do you want me to join you in the main event mafia? The entire crowd starts chanting, yeah, or starts starts cheering, yes, except for one person in the crowd who's going, no, no, that person is James from Deadlock. <laughs> Wearing a Kevin Steen shirt. Oh, you can see the video. Amazing. It's on YouTube, and it's oh, hilarious. Oh, is that, is that, is that, is that the same shirt he was wearing on the flight when, when Matt Hardy took that picture of him? Oh, I don't. It's the it's the mugshot shirt. Yeah, it's the okay, same shirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah. They were apparently. I guess I guess they were on the same flight, and Matt Hardy was like, "Hey, I like your shirt." When was that? Ten years ago. Okay, yeah, maybe that was the. I flight just saw to that reposted. To... Yeah. Oh. Oh. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just saw that. It was pretty funny. I was like watching. I was like, "Whoa!" Wait, because it's a split second. And I was like, well, who that that guy saying no? He looks familiar. <laughs> oh, That's so false. funny. It's James. Um, but uh, but yeah. And then the Bellator fight incidentally didn't even happen uh, because uh, Ortiz got injured or rampage. I forget who. I think it was Ortiz got injured several days before the fight itself. So it was all for naught. It was all, all for naught. Yeah. Yeah. I'm gonna yeah. get to the bottom of this, Matt Hardy. I just saw it the other day. I want to make sure we get the details right. See if I can oh yeah, pull it no, up. absolutely. You get your it might due take diligence a little bit, done, So we right? can we can I'll, I'll circle back to it if I can find it. All right, circle back to that. In the meantime, Larson, would you like to pay some bills? Let's do it. All right. Uh, this episode of Going in Raw is sponsored by Better Help. The season, the holiday season, rather, is upon us, and it can be a lot. It can be a time of joy, but it can also be a time of stress, anxiety, and sadness. And if you're dealing with seasonal blues during the holidays, therapy can be a bright spot amid all the stress, something to look forward to, to help you feel grounded and to provide you with tools to manage everything going on. Yeah, I've been there before. I can think of one especially difficult holiday season back in my mid-20s when I was dealing with 
anxiety. And my anxiety got really bad. It got so bad that I realized in order to live a happier, more productive life, I needed to go to therapy. It took me a few tries to find someone I felt really comfortable talking to. But once I did, I was able to learn positive coping skills to help me manage my anxiety and get me back on track to becoming a better Larson. So if you're thinking about starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited for your schedule. All you got to do to get started is fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist, and you can switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. So find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash raw today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash raw. All right, moving on to number eight. Eight. Vader, when he went to the W to W to F in 1996 or so. I think he debuted yeah, in the Royal it, Rumble it was, in 96. It was, it was interesting because Vader in Japan, wrecking people, wrecking everybody. Got his eye popped out partially and put it back in middle of a match with Stan Hansen, I believe. Yeah. Goes to WCW, wrecking everybody. Wrecking everybody. Just wrecking everybody. Yeah. You know, and, and, and he goes to WWE... And again, it's a situation where it seems like an ill fit. Vader's style was not WWF, WWE style at the time. You know, uh, he was he was a notorious snug wrestler. Yeah. He hit hard. Yeah. Bret Hart complained about how hard Vader hit. So this was kind of interesting because I did like a little bit. I went back because I, I think I'd already listened to this episode, but I went back and, and, and refreshed myself a little bit. Um, mm-hmm. the, the something to wrestle with the, the Pritchard podcast about yeah, Vader. Yeah. his take was interesting. And I listened to a little bit of what um, Vader himself said about uh, regrets going to WWE or WWF at the time. And and I have my own thoughts on it. It's something we talked about pretty recently. So according to Pritchard, Vader came in, in his words, as a shell of his former self. And part of that Pritchard believes or, or speculated that maybe it had to do with the story of Paul Orndorff beating up Vader with his flip flops. Oh on yeah, 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 yeah. In WCW, um, he also mentions the stiff aspect of, of of his style and how that might have flown in Japan, but that's not going to work against guys like the Undertaker. And if that's what your thing is, it's not that you can't rely on just that. Yeah. Um, which I think are are good points. Vader himself in an interview actually said that he regrets when he was on the phone with Vince, Vince was pitching him on Vince's idea for Vader. It was, it was the, I think he was going to rename him the Mastodon. Mastodon. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and Vader said no. And Vader in the interview regretted that. He says, you know, he's the boss of the company. I was kind of full. I was, I believed in myself and I built this brand for myself and I'm paraphrasing here. I built this brand for myself and then I didn't want to change it, but he's, he's running the company. It's his company. Who am I to say no to the guy cutting me the check to come in? And you have to ask yourself, you know how with Vince McMahon, he can sour on you very quick. Yeah. And if you come in unwilling to buy in to what he's trying to sell. Yeah. Then he's not, you're probably not going to, unless you completely change his mind out there in the ring, yeah. you're not going to, he's not going to buy into you is my belief. Also, I actually kind of think it's a little bit of what you and I talked about the other day when somebody asked us on the show, why is it? Do, do you think, uh, for example, Bart Gunn could mm-hmm. have succeeded in WWE had he knocked out Butterbean? or Ken Shamrock, or Dan Severn, and there was another name that was thrown to us, and I forget who it was. Oh, Dr. Death, Steve Williams. Yeah, yeah, that was the genesis of the question, yeah. And you and I sort of agreed with, it's in WWE, and this was in 96, so you're leading up to the Attitude Era, when they're yeah. starting to put together what success, you know, what they're going to need for success, mm-hmm. and, and it had a lot to do with the personalities involved. It wasn't like, hey, here's this random guy, let's throw a vocational gimmick on it. It's let's try to get the most out of 
the ringmaster Steve Austin. Let's see what we can do with him. Austin comes up with this character. They run with it. You put uh, the Connecticut Blue Blood with his best friend Shawn Michaels and tell people to suck it. They ran with it and let their actual personalities come yeah. through. Um, Vader was a stiff worker who popped his eye back in, but I don't know that the personality in WWF system at the time yeah, yeah. would have translated to the kind of fan engagement needed to get over. No, I don't think so either. I don't think so either. No, probably not. Probably not. I found the tweet from Matt Hardy oh, dated uh, August 16th, 2013. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. And it's a picture of James yeah. wearing uh, Kevin Steen, the mugshot shirt. That's it. Yep. Uh, Matt Hardy tweeted flying from RDU. I don't know which airport that is to LAX. And the first thing I see is CM Pulse wearing a, a Fight Steen fight shirt <laughs> with a picture. I love it. I love That's it. Great. That's great. That's Fantastic. awesome. Yeah. Fantastic. It was funny, like speaking of Matt Hardy, uh, when uh, at the tail end of the clip, I listened to the Vader stuff. Uh, what's his face? Conrad said something along the lines of, I think it was the Matt Hardy. Maybe it was something else. He was like, Matt Hardy showed up. Matt Hardy version one. What'd you think of this? And Pritchard just said, I didn't get it. <laughs> and then I hit pause because I had to research other shit. <laughs> I'll be honest with you, Pritchard. I didn't get it either. <laughs> it was like the third iteration of Matt Hardy and he's calling know, himself version one. one. Anyways, let's go ahead and move on uh, to number seven. Seven. Mr. It. Wait, can I put my mic up here and drop it? Down? Can you? Not really. Not really. You there we the, go. It's kind of like this. Kind of. Mr. Anderson. You gotta grab it from the back. Yeah. Mr. Kennedy in TNA. So when he showed up in TNA. Yeah. So, you know, obviously while he was still in WWE, they had a, a pretty high hopes for him. He was the one person who won money in the bank and said, I'm cashing this in at WrestleMania. Yeah. He yeah. actually stayed at that. However, never came to pass. Uh, Edge beat him for the briefcase. Uh, due to an injury that turned out to be a contusion rather than like a torn triceps or something like that. Misdiagnosis, yeah. And it turned out like his career could basically never get back on track in WWE. Sure. WWE. Yeah. So, they let him go. Yeah. He shows up in TNA Impact in 2010 and trying to capitalize on the momentum he had in WWE like a few years prior, mm -hmm. like in 2006. Yeah. So, four years later, they push him as a main event guy. Yeah. And I don't know, by that time, I don't know, he just didn't feel... And part of it was an impact. Like, 2010, that's when they were like, hey, if you're a former WB guy, come on in. You're going to be our main eventer. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, I think around this time, this is around uh, RVD's title reign there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you bring him in four years past his peak of popularity and be like, hey, he's a main event guy. Felt a little flat. Yeah. You know... Uh, it's it's one of those things where if an audience and we've seen this in AEW as well, if the audience has seen a, a character in a certain way in WWE, it's difficult for them to come in and just based off of name value alone, the fact that they've been on TV, it's difficult to assume that they can then come in and that automatically translates to, yeah. hey, I'm a big deal here. And Mr. Anderson, Mr. Kennedy in WWE had already sort of underwhelmed in in the final analysis. He had plenty of fans. Lots of people in our, in our audience yeah. liked Mr. Kennedy's work. I never saw it, and I don't think you ever saw it. Um, but in John Cena and Randy Orton didn't see it either. And so... When, you know, he shows up in TNA and then he did the whole like, I'm going to cut a promo on Triple H who didn't like me because I chewed my gum. And so I'm going to be extra obnoxious with chewing gum. And that's just a stupid look. That's a bad yeah. look. Yeah. yeah. There's got to be some reinvention there. When Luke Harper, uh, uh, you know, was released from WWE and went to AEW as Brody Lee and and showed what he could do. It was a, a sea change. Rusev. It was to, a revelation. To, yeah. To, uh, to Miro as well. You know, yep. certain people can can really show what you have. This guy didn't seem to be any different or any better than what he already was in WWE, which I never thought was all that mm -hmm. special. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, around that time, they had you know, TNA in their main event scene. They had Kurt Angle, mm -hmm. yeah, RVD, uh, Jeff Hardy, real established names. 
actual main eventers, former world champions in WWE. Yeah. 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 So, you know, I don't know. I don't know that. Did, 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 did Mr. Anderson have a, didn't he have like a, 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 a jizz shirt also? I think so. Yeah. I think he had a jizz shirt. Yeah. I don't I was know why that like was like such a common that. design element in, in TNA. I don't know. Somebody really liked their shirts that looked like there was specimen on it. Yeah. He was a two time TNA world champion. Yeah. You know, you got to you know, try things out, I guess. I guess. But that's what, you know, he's probably like sort of the prime for me, anyways. When people start referring to AEW as like, oh, they're just signing more to XWWF oh, guys. TNA, you mean? Sorry. Well, no, when AEW. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. When gotcha. people yeah, criticize yeah. AEW for being like where Edge, Edge came in. Yeah, and yeah. And it's like he wasn't even on TV last night, I don't think. Well, neither no. was Christian, though. Um, when he came in, it's like, ah, oh, they're just bringing, they're just signing guys who have, you know, are over the hill in WWE. Anderson wasn't over the hill, but like he was a former WWE guy. And when I think of like, oh, they're just signing former WWE guys to sign former WWE guys. Yeah. Anderson sort of tops that list. Yep. Yep. Anyways, let's move on to number six. Six. Woo! Ric Flair and A.W. Right. Ooh. Ooh. Yeah. You know. Yeah, I just don't know what he's necessarily going to offer. They put him front and center of some collision poster. Did you see that? <laughs> no, I didn't. That's funny. Yeah, there's like a collision poster, I think, for his next scheduled appearance in January or something like that. He's front and center. Huge. I mean, Ric when Flair he came. Image. When he, when he was presented as a gift to Sting, he was like, I'm going to be there with you every week. To, well, I don't know. He didn't pervade him say every week. but nice. yeah, like, I'm on the road with you through through March. Yeah, yeah, I through. Guess, I guess the subtext is I'm, we're, we're, I'm riding shotgun, Sting. That's what I thought it was going to be, yeah. You know, every week. Thankfully, it hasn't been the case because I don't know if we need to see Ric Flair on TV. Well, I don't even know if we need to see Ric Flair on TV, period. But we definitely don't need to see him every week. So AEW has been facing quite a bit of criticism um, on several fronts lately. Um, I saw today, we're filming this on uh, Thursday. Um, I saw today people, you know, really expressing their displeasure with how they've been treating Ring of Honor. That seems to be the new thing to tell you, especially with, with Joe, the inflection point being Joe vacating the title and people using that as a springboard to talk about what's been going on since they bought Ring of Honor, which is a whole lot of nothing. Yeah. And, um, and now the revelation that apparently the CW wanted to get Ring of Honor TV rights and Tony Khan said, no, because I want to bundle my TV deal, which we'll see if that works out or not. But, you know, AEW, they're a bit of a bit of a punching bag these days for critics. Yeah. And Ric Flair being signed to AEW for basically an energy drink deal um, after Tony Khan had multiple times publicly blasted Vince McMahon for his off-screen behavior, allegations, et cetera, et cetera. When Ric Flair has had similar allegations thrown his way, seemed a bit hypocritical, and I don't mm -hmm. know what it brings in a positive way to the company. Yeah, I don't know either. And and and, and we've seen of late as well, AEW at times, an over-reliance on nostalgia. Mm -hmm, yeah which seems a bit antithetical to kind of the, the on, on which the company was founded mm -hmm. as an alternative because at the time that WB was, was, was so soaked in nostalgia yeah. so often, you know, how, how often would they say, all right, we got a special episode. Let's bring in all of the legends and let people just like revel in the nostalgia of our history. Mm -hmm. yeah. And it's okay to reference and, and uh, rest, you know, the history of wrestling. I, that's one thing I appreciate about AEW is that they reference the history of wrestling outside of AEW. Mm -hmm. I yeah. appreciate that. That being said, when you bring in most recently, Adam Copeland, mm -hmm. and he's literally rated our superstar because for whatever reason, WWE never trademarked that, <laughs> you know, relying on the nickname he came up with about 15 years ago. Mm hmm. It's, it's just it's, it's it's just nostalgia. There's nothing new to it. Yeah, yeah. and it's, I just don't really feel like it brings a whole lot to the program. And that's on top of everything else that comes with bringing in Ric Flair. Yeah, I mean, at least in the case of Edge, he can still wrestle really good yeah. matches. Like he can yeah. do that. And I think that Edge has it in him somewhere to. And and I hope that this feud and then maybe alliance down the line with Christian can bring it out of him. But, you know, there is there is an edge. My personal favorite edge wasn't even the rated R superstar stuff when he was a very opportunistic villain. It was before that with Christian when he was doing mm -hmm. the five the, the five second poses. 
I thought that stuff was wildly entertaining. His show with Christian was wildly entertaining, and I'd love for him to tap into some of that. Um, but Ric Flair, I don't know what he brings. I honestly don't, besides just the name Ric Flair, and I just don't think that AEW needs that. Well, I don't think they can benefit from it. No, I don't think so either. Really. Uh, did you notice any Woo energy drink on the show last night? No, I did not. I My eyes weren't really peeled, but I feel like I would have noticed that they're very colorful cans. And I think they would have pointed it out if it was. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah, they'd be you, like, know. you know. And here's another thing about Flair being an AEW. You have to worry constantly until his contract runs out that he's going to try to have another match. Yeah, well, you have to worry that Tony Khan's going to allow him to have another match. Yeah, right? and that too. Exactly, yeah. Uh, let's move on to number five. Five. Alberto El Patron. You have it here as Alberto Del Rio for TNA, Larson, but... Of course, by the time he was there, he was Alberto the boss, Alberto El Patron. Except when he made his debut and they misspelled his name on his Tron, <laughs> and then they had to reshoot it, and the crowd was like, we already t- reacted <laughs> oh, to this. They didn't get the pop that they, that they could have had nope. because, yeah. Nope, nope. I think um, at that point, you just deal with the misspelling and then just go with the reaction of the crowd or sh- edit around it best you can. Yeah, you got you to gotta do it in post, man. You got to do it in post. You got to do something. You got to do something. So, uh, a lot of Albertos time and impact was uh, fraught with legal issues mm-hmm. uh, he was suspended at one point mm-hmm. um what was he suspended he, for i think it was the was it the page domestic stuff? yeah oh 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 was it the big one like the i think there, like, so yeah yeah i think it was around the time that he would go on periscope and talk and talk crap about triple h and stuff too well that was okay that was something different though i thought that he yeah, yeah. i know that was something different but i think but you know okay there was there was just, I mean, he was like an, an impact for like a year. Was it? It was. I was reviewing Impact back then. And here's the thing about Alberto back then he wasn't bad. Like, I thought there was some cool stuff with him and Conan, but like, there's just, I, the, the thing is, there's too much baggage. There's a lot of baggage with there him. There is. That comes and remember, we him. went, I don't, I don't remember what year yeah. it was, but it must have been around this time because it was an Impact co-branded show. Mm-hmm. We went to yeah. a big-time wrestling show out in the yeah. Bay Area, and the main event was Alberto versus Moose. Yeah. And throughout Alberto's career to that point, like I never really saw – I never saw it with yeah, him right. as a performer. Yeah. I never saw it. He's a good wrestler. Yeah. But I never saw it. And and we we've had conversations several times about – well, he just he just must have like a really magnetic personality, one on one or something. Because Vince was convinced he had it mm-hmm. for a yeah. stretch. Yeah, and went to the show and there was maybe 150, 200 people there, maybe a little bit more than that. It was a pretty good sized venue. And they had like a, a, a no holds barred match. Went on to the crowd and stuff. And afterwards, Alberto dropped a promo. And that was the first time I was like, oh no, I kind of see it. Yeah, he's charming in I, person. Yeah, I kind of see it now. Yeah, but as mentioned. Whatever he could bring as an in-ring performer, you had to deal with everything else with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And 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 the fact that they probably brought him in with a lot of high hopes. I mean, he was inserted mm-hmm. to the world title seat basically right away. He was, yeah, he was. When he debuted, and then for him to only last there a year. Yeah. would I would imagine from people in Impact seem, be seen as a huge letdown. So he debuted in March of 2017, and then in July he was suspended due to uh, personal, a uh, personal domestic violence issue with his real life girlfriend, Paige. This is from Wikipedia. And as a result of the suspension on August 14th, he was stripped of the unified, because at that point they were doing the GFW stuff, mm-hmm. um, World Heavyweight Championship. He came back in November. Um, he said, claiming, yeah, I remember he, he dropped this uh, promo, claimed that everybody is a loser and a backstabber. Uh, and then he confronted Jeremy Borash, who was working as a producer there. Uh, he interrupted the main event, but then he was released. Okay, so then he's yeah, he, he stuck around until April, but then he no showed the Lucha Underground versus Impact. It was that Wrestling. Media Weekend show they did the, yeah, the Lucha right. Underground Impact crossover show. Apparently, no show. Then yeah, yeah, he, and was then released. he was released. So yeah, you know, I mean, he had you know, I don't know what three months of of good stuff. And then you know he, he he got into trouble outside of the outside of the ring, um, but uh, but yeah no it's funny because you could t- in person he's tall he's great looking you know uh, charismatic in person 
I never, yeah, you're right. I never really saw it. Maybe there was, maybe it was one of those things where if they got the creative right for him, it could have clicked. Cause you know, when you watch, I always go back to this, watch Austin's first couple of months as the ringmaster in WWF. You don't see it. You don't nope. see it. Soon as he's stone cold, you see it. Yeah. It's there. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes it just takes that thing to find it, you know? Totally. totally. Anyways, talking about a guy who couldn't find it. Number four. Four. Bret Hart and WCW. Now, this is one of those where who's to blame? Bret claims it's Bischoff. Bischoff claims it's Bret. I probably trust Bret here, to be honest with you. Yeah, I probably would too, more so. I mean, from a creative standpoint, WCW bungled so much of of how they approached Brett. Like his his first like real major appearance as, in terms of major role on their programming should not be as a special guest enforcer for Hogan and Sting. Whoa, 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 Especially, whoa, whoa! Wasn't what? it? Wasn't he actually a special guest enforcer for Bischoff versus Abisko? Oh, was that earlier? I dude, I think I think it was on it was on I, dude, I swear to god. Go ahead and 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 So that I mean that's what he's most like his you know, uh, most impactful if you will. WCW moment early in his career because that whole thing was a mess. Yeah, so he was a special guest referee for Zabisco versus Bischoff and because he had the referee Oh, that's even worse. status. He came in yeah. Yeah. That's now, even worse then. I forgot he's about that. Coming off Survivor Series where he screwed out of the title. He shows up and let's say like they can't because I think Bishop or somebody claimed that they couldn't use him for a specified amount of time after Survivor yeah. Series. Well, I think his contract didn't run up for a little bit after Survivor Series. OK, OK. Um, and then uh, and then and and then that's, you know, and H Hogan on uh, it was Sam Roberts podcast. I was watching. I'm sorry, Bret Hart on Sam Roberts podcast was saying. They should have brought me in, and the first thing that I do is put Hogan in a sharpshooter. Mm -hmm. Put me right there immediately. You know, get me in the mix with him and Sting somehow, some way. And I mean, they did. <laughs> they they did, but it yeah. wasn't it wasn't as a competitor. It was it was as special guest referee for Zabisco versus Bischoff, and then he just decided to interject in a match that didn't actually need interjection because Hogan politic to get the the yeah. the count changed. And then part of it too is is from the outside looking in, and I don't know if Brett spoke about this, but coming from the screw job, which happened about uh, was it twenty six years ago, this month. Uh, today, I think today is the today, today? is the the anniversary on, is today. Yeah, on, I saw that on, on uh, November 9th. Huh? As we're filming um, this, yeah, and and you could tell that the betrayal hit him hard. You know, he what he didn't seem to be the exact. He didn't seem to be the same after that. At least for a while, you know, he seemed a bit aloof. So, he yeah, didn't necessarily seem to have the same maybe intensity or or passion. Yeah, you know, I know that this and and this is again one of those questions where because before he and this is on the the the, the broken skull sessions I was watching a little clip where he's talking about this where Austin you know had said um you go over to WCW they don't know what to do a damn with you. You're a worker's worker. You should be in. A, you should be mixing it up in the top scene. And Brett was like, "Yeah, like the way they use me." He says, and he says, "You told me that before I went, and when I got there, Kevin Nash and others were telling me the same thing. They're not going to know what to do with me. So you have to ask yourself: Was it a really bad first impression that put him his mindset there? Was it? Was it like he got there and it's like?" This you're gonna do what with me? That sucks. This is terrible. I didn't even want to leave the other place. Yeah. And he gets there and they're like, You're gonna be a special guest referee for Zabisco versus Bischoff. Fucking what? Why am why am yeah. I not coming out after Sting Hogan attacking Hogan or 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 yeah. you know, stepping up to him? We have so much history. Yep. Um, maybe the fact that he was given, you know, he's coming from doing Shakespeare and then he's given, you know, a B tier sitcom script as an analogy, yeah. maybe that he's like, this is crap. I don't want you. This is, this is, a, I immediately regret this decision. You know? Yeah. That's, I mean, that could be part of it too. I mean, there's a lot going, there was a lot going on with Brett. He did come time. off as being checked out though. Yeah. He did come out be, being somewhat checked out. Now, was it because of the screw job? Was it because of the atmosphere 
in WCW was a combination thereof. Mm-hmm. Who's to say? I mean, yeah. I, I, again, you know, there's probably varying perspectives on that. And it's pretty—it's uh, easy for Bischoff to say when he got there, he was a shell of the person he was, because that's eliminating blame for himself. Exactly. I remember when, because I think it was on uh, Legends with JBL, maybe when JBL confronted him straight up and said, "You had the the WWF champion who didn't actually lose his title, and everybody knew that. Was it a mistake not for for him not to come in?" And you immediately go there with him and you put him in the world title scene and Bischoff just straight up. He couldn't say anything about it. He was like, yeah, it was probably a bad move, you know, because that, yeah, you, you, you fumbled what seemed to be the surest ball you could handle. I know. I know. How do you fumble that? So as Bret Hart, I could understand if I go in there and they're like, wow, you fumbled me to that degree. Okay. Well, that sucks. Yeah, yeah, I understand, but he'd be checked out totally. Yeah, yeah. Totally. It's funny because he was like, you know, in the Sam Roberts podcast, he was like, yeah, you know, I was, you know, was, I was, I was even hating money back then. You know, I'd get a paycheck and it'd be like a hundred thousand dollars for the week, and uh, I'd be like, oh, you know, what am I even doing? You know, he's, I, I'd fly down to do TV, and like they Bischoff would come up to me, you know, thirty minutes before and say, we don't need you this week. But it's a guarantee. Like he got his, he gets his money for that week, for that date, yeah. for a hundred thousand yeah. dollars. He gets his money for that. That's crazy. And they're just like, no, we don't need you. You're paying a hundred thousand dollars for not to use me, Bret Hart. Yeah, you have Bret Hart. It's crazy. Uh, <laughs> number three, three Ultimate Warrior oh in goodness. WCW. Now this oh. one, I think we can probably play squarely on Ultimate Warrior. Yes, <laughs> but well, I think like, Warrior. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. Yeah, Warrior and Hogan, because didn't Hogan want to bring him in so he yeah. get his win back from WrestleMania six? There's yes. a lot of blame to go around. I agree. Yes. I agree. Yes. So I'm reading this here, where apparently uh, Warrior's debut promo in WCW was a lot of seven minutes. He went 27. Oh my God! I remember it was really long. I remember it was yeah. very long. They, hold on a second. They thought they were just going to give him seven minutes for a promo. It's the Ultimate Warrior. I mean, at least you have to give him fifteen. That's just unrealistic. I mean, it is. I know seven minutes. I mean, you gotta know who you're working with there. It's a three-hour program. Seven minutes. Wow. Seven minutes. That's crazy. Seven minutes. I think the the, the highlight of the Warriors' time at WCW was when a uh, Beefcake walked out as the disciple. Yeah. That was yeah, Talk, like I wonder how Beefcake felt about that deep down, because like Hogan know. was his dude. I know. And then to even in kayfabe turn on him. Oh my goodness. I know. Um, so yeah, 1998 in the lead up to Halloween Havoc, uh, uh, Ultimate Warrior, to uh, to reignite the rivalry uh, that of course uh, saw its apex at WrestleMania six in Toronto. One one, uh, what is it? What did Vince say at the beginning of that show? When gal- galaxies collide, or some weird shit, something like that. that. Yeah, I can yeah. see the. Da, da, well, how's the WrestleMania theme go? Da, 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 da. Yeah, yeah, right. That one. Yeah. yeah, and it's got like stars and stuff, and there's like a constellation, constellation of the us, Ultimate right? Warrior. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So this is a little bit less than that because that match, from what I remember, like wasn't awful. For what? Although the Warrior is blown up like three minutes into it, but yeah, otherwise it was it was as Warrior matches goes, it was watchable. <laughs> Right, and then we get to we get to uh, what is this? I mean, it's only eight years. If you think about it, it's nuts. It's only eight years later. I know. And these guys, the match is absolutely hilarious because it was clear as day neither guy wanted to follow whatever plan they imagined they had come up with. I'm really curious about like what the actual plan for that. Did match. They just like, hey, we'll call it in the ring, brother. Maybe. You have like the two biggest egos in professional wrestling, one of whom is kind of justified because let's face it, Hogan, come on, like he kind of brought pro wrestling to the mainstream. It, it, you know, Vince wouldn't have been able to, to succeed without him. I kind of believe that. Warrior just sort of showed up, you know, got gassed really quick, said a bunch of weird shit, had some cool face paint, was jacked to the gills on roids, and and basically lasted a cup of coffee. He was not around very long. He was just no. very impactful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, this whole thing was an absolute disaster. Uh, I'm guessing they thought they were real clever with the One Warrior Nation 
uh, uh, you know, spit on the NWO. Oh, I thought that was pretty clever. To be honest with you, I was like, "Oh fuck, one warrior!" And didn't he? One, uh, one of his appearances where they had the trap door in the ring jacked up uh, Davy Boy Smith's back. Yeah, you're right. It did. Yeah, I was just I watched a YouTube clip on that the other day. Oh man, I forgot about that one. So pretty much a disaster all around. One of the worst matches in the history of wrestling: Warrior versus Hogan at Halloween Havoc '98. And they actually preempted on the pay per view a good match: yeah, Goldberg and DDP. Yeah. Not without its entertainment value, that Hogan Warrior match. Because it no, is, it's got a train wreck quality for sure. It is really funny watching two guys be so completely on different pages in a wrestling ring when they're both gassed, jacked, and just completely just brimming with ego and don't want to do anything for the other yep. guy. Yep. It's pretty funny. Yep. It can be. It can't be. Yeah. Also an absolute mess. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's move on to number two. To Hulk Hogan and TNA. Talk about ego and hubris. Oh, my goodness gracious. Bringing in Hogan to thinking that you can have it. You bring in Hogan and Bischoff. You think, all right, Dixie Carter's there thinking, well, maybe now we could compete. Mm, don't, we can yeah, go don't try that. Head to head with Monday Night Raw. Don't do that. You don't they tried do it, that. Steve. Yeah, they did it. They tried it, and it didn't work. It was an abject failure. It was, yeah, you know, it's, I understand, I understand if he's available, he is the guy that brought wrestling mainstream. Here's the thing, though. such a good thing going with everybody else that was That's there. the thing. You look at the talent at the time that was in Impact, their, ta- their roster was pretty damn loaded. Yeah. Pretty damn loaded, and you focus on the, the, the talent you have there that you've built up. Because you look at the numbers they were getting in what, like two thousand seven, eight, mm-hmm. they were pretty good. Mm-hmm. Yeah, impacts was, and I, I guess the idea is like we'll take what we have here and we'll add Hogan to it. Mm-hmm. Then you know, hey, we're talking about WB type numbers. It just yeah. didn't work out because as Hogan often does, he just overshadows everything else. Yeah, I remember there was an AJ Styles shoot interview, and AJ mm-hmm. Styles like the most diplomatic shoot interview you'll ever watch. And he says, you know, Hogan came, Hogan and Bischoff came in. Of course, he had Bischoff to the equation. 2009, sorry, that Hogan. uh, Okay. uh, okay. So he says, you know, Hogan came in and like they didn't know or like if you're going to come into a promotion, don't you endeavor to learn like the names of the major players there? And AJ's like, and AJ said something like, yeah, they came in. They didn't even know my name. And it's like, are you kidding me? Because it's the Hogan show, and you know he's gonna get his his big paycheck, and he's gonna make it all about him, brother. Um, and uh, and you know Ric Flair came in also, so <laughs> they had they had like a bloodbath match, I think, at one point. Yeah, but uh, but yeah, no, it's 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 I under I get it, it's Hogan, but you know, man, you gotta have you gotta have faith in your own in your own product. And uh, and and from there, there seemed to be like a creative turn where it did become all about Hogan yeah. uh, and everybody's fake music themes. He had like a fake NWO theme, yeah. NWO, NWO theme. And then I think even when he like he, he probably had like a fake real American theme, maybe. I don't probably. Know. So uh, for some content text, I have an article here from Wrestling Inc. from April 3rd, 2009. That week's episode of Impact uh, drew 1.97 million viewers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Almost Um, 2 million. Yeah. So it's not like they were floundering at the time. No, at the time, WWE, I think, was probably doing closer to... Like 3 or 4, it looked like. I think... Oh, was it 3 or 4? I thought it was closer to like 5 or 6. Well, their ratings were in the 3s. I have 2010 numbers here. Their ratings were 3.7, I can never tell between like the... The three point seven or like how many mil is that? Does that mean three point seven million? No, if it's ratings and no. Yeah, those are weird. Those numbers I can never I can never figure out what they are. Okay, but in any so event. so here's another uh, article from January twenty ten. Mm-hmm. So by January, I mean there was a segment with Hogan that got two point nine million viewers in in January twenty ten. Mm-hmm. So Raw had a uh, drew five point six million. Okay, okay, all right. But yeah, that's 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 those are pretty good numbers. Really good numbers. Yeah. But then I guess by the time Hogan left, it was like the damage was done. Exactly, because he left in twenty thirteen, and then by then it was it was. Mm-hmm. Mm-mm. 
And they never recovered. Oh wait, yes, they're still around. No, but now they're they're uh, having a, a renaissance. Like the yeah. stigma of TNA is pretty much gone. Yeah, I mean their numbers are still terrible, but they're on Axis, so nobody can watch. But I mean, like relative to the rest of wrestling programming, which is down overall. Yeah, I mean they're down a lot more, but still. <laughs> <laughs> they're not down like uh, and you know like they're on TV, unlike NWA, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, let's move on to number one. One. Vince Russo, bro. So there is still to this day a conspiracy theory, a line of thought that Vince Russo was sent to WCW by Vince McMahon uh, to, to ruin the company. Yeah. That's how bad his run in WCW was. It was epically bad. I remember he was there. First, he was like, what, the powers that be or some shit like that, yeah. where he was like, you know, it was like a Steinbrenner and Seinfeld thing where you only see him like sort of he'd be off camera. But then like, you know, he he, became, he was on camera. He won their championship. He had David Arquette winning their championship. Wait, was that him? That was him, wasn't it? Was what? Russo responsible for Arquette? I think so. OK. In any event, uh, he was res- him and Bischoff were responsible for. uh for all the titles being vacated, probably had a part in 26 different title uh, changes in the year 2000 alone. I don't know. Yeah. I sort of equ- everything bad from 99 on. I, I equate to Russo. I'm probably wrong about that, but well, I know he was kind of in and out a couple junctures. You know, yeah, he was there, he was gone, and then he was back with Bischoff. Yeah, I think that's the way it went. Yeah, yeah. And then and I so and he I, was back with Bischoff by the time Bash of the Beach 2000 happened because that was the whole right episode yeah, yeah, of Dark yeah. Side of the Ring was there very perspective yeah that's right yeah and i uh, dude honestly like bishop to me it was i'm sorry russo to me was like the last straw as a fan it was like oh there this isn't even this isn't even good like train wreck watching stuff you know this is this yeah. is so bad it's just it's just bad it's not so bad it's good um and you know he he it was it was vince russo without the vince mcmahon filter and so you, it was just bad. It was just bad all around. Yeah, yeah. And of course, uh, he was brought into TNA in the early days by Jeff and Jerry J- Jarrett. Mm-hmm. And uh, he's probably responsible for a lot of bad there too. Yeah, probably, probably. Yeah. And now he's a podcast, and I think that's probably bad too. I don't know. I've listened to like <laughs> clips here and there, but it's kind of like that's all I could do. Yeah, I know. I'm like, I don't agree with pretty much anything he ever says. So Same. Yeah, no. Yeah. I, the worst free agent signing in wrestling history, Vince Russo. He probably damn near tanked that company by himself. Yeah. Yeah. Between that and the dude at AOL not wanting wrestling. That was kind yeah, of that it. guy really tanked WCW. Yeah. He's like, I don't want but this But maybe shit. if the wrestling was good and not what Vince Russo was putting on TV, he'd be like, oh, this pro wrestling stuff's not bad. He's like, oh, man, this is really good stuff. Who's this Who's this guy? Vince Russo? Is he? Was, was he wrestling in the 80s like Hulk Hogan was? No? Why is he our champion right now? Yeah, why is he our champion? Even if he won it accidentally, it still doesn't make any sense. <laughs> why is he there with a football helmet on? None of the other competitors have football helmets on. Is that legal? Are they allowed to do that? <laughs> <laughs> and then it cuts to James from Deadlock in the crowd. No. <laughs> it's a right. kind of shirt. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Oh, man. That's going to do it for Count Out this week. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. We appreciate it. Till next time, we'll see you around. Goodbye.